Yeah, thank you for inviting me here. It's a huge pleasure. In fact, I should admit that Italy is my favorite country in the world. And so I decided to travel uh, a month through Italy. Um, and I have never been in uh, Genoa before. And I have to say it's a fantastic city. Like, you, you must feel very privileged to live here in such a beautiful city. Um, yeah, so I'm um, going to talk about uh, basically how science can help AI and how AI can help science. And I've been having many interesting discussions this morning and I already saw that there's lots of interesting intersections between what's happening um, in this institute um, and in, uh, the, in what you will see in this particular talk. I should also apologize a little bit because uh, this is a room filled with theoretical computer scientists and mathematicians and so you might expect a huge number of equations and detailed analysis treat this more as an inspirational talk. Um, it's going, it's, it's a lot of pictures and, and ideas, uh, but feel free to ask me questions, of course. That's totally fine. I can, I can dive deeper into details if you wish. There's also papers, of course, but I, I tend to think that when you try to go into real a lot of detail, you lose a lot of people as well. So yeah, so this is the, the, the thing I want to talk about. So I'll, I'll introduce it's on the introduction, it's an introduction actually, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the techniques uh, that we need to understand before we dive into some details um, and some inspirational introduction. And then I'll talk about how AI can help science. And then I'm going to talk about how science can help AI. Um, and then I'll conclude. Um, so. I think you can almost cut AI in two ways these days. Um, there's two camps. As sometimes you see with fields that are growing up, you create um, sort of camps. And so there are in statistics, there is these the frequentists and there's the Bayesians. Um, and in, in the physics, there is um, people who interpret you know, quantum mechanics using multiverses or quantum mechanics using co collapsing wave functions or so there, there's there's camps everywhere and AI is creating thank you some of these camps as well so now there is the so-called scaling camp or the deep learning camp which is basically throw a lot of data at a problem you know scale your model up to billions of parameters and throw you know 10,000 GPUs at this problem and then you'll get chat GPT or some of these other stuff which are really impressive. Um, the other camp is more on the symbolic side, basically the statement that you can never learn everything from just uh, looking at data. The world is too complex. Uh, you can see this in self-driving cars, right? I mean, are you ever going to see every de every situation in the world? Um, or, you know, and how, how would you be able to generalize from what you see to new situations? People don't believe you can do this with just um, the current machine learning techniques and you would need to put lots of prior uh, knowledge, in particular symbolic uh, methods into this. So that's, that's the two camps. I'm um, squarely at this point in the, I have to admit, in the deep learning camp, so I'll talk about that. Um, and uh, so here's a, here's a couple of things that have happened recently in this field. Um, so there is, uh, you know, this particular application, uh, AlphaFold, where you give it an amino acid sequence, and the model uh, trains itself to predict the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And uh, this is a product by DeepMind. It has now, by now, folded in silico millions of proteins. Um, and I've, I've been told this is actually very useful. It's not the final thing that people want to know necessarily, but it is at least, at least extremely useful for biologists to, uh, to have this information. Uh, another example is video generation. So here's, you prompt the system with like a shot following a hiker through a jungle brush, and it generates just a video showing that, right? Or a sh an aerial shot of a mountain landscape, and it will generate that particular video. Now, um, this field, I should say, is going extremely fast. So you can say, well, that doesn't look very impressive, right? You know, but you know, maybe a couple of months ago it looked like this, and now it looks like this. Now it's just pr very predictable that you know, in a couple of years, this looks amazing, right? Um, and in fact, you know, you could perhaps predict that you give it, you know, generate a movie. Uh, you know, and here's here's the script. Generate a movie for me, and it might actually generate the entire movie, right? I am, I've been. I've been wrong very many times in predicting things and 
very too pessimistic. And every time reality has caught up with me. So I'm not going to predict anymore that things are not possible. Things are really moving very, very quickly. Um, and here's, here's another one for the mathematicians in the room, which I really like. Uh, the prompt is, can you write a proof that there are infinitely many primes with every line that rhymes? And you can look this up on the internet. And it will actually give you a good proof in rhyme. Right? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just impressed by that. I'm not sure maybe it's not. not anyway, I, I find these things quite impressive. Um, but what I'm really interested in is not in these kind of things, um, impressive as they are. What I'm really interested in is in the opportunity that these technologies offer us in the sciences. I find science an infinitely more interesting application than um, ad predicting, you know, who, who's going to click on what ad or something like this. There's a very, very rich and interesting number of applications in the sciences. So as I already mentioned, the protein folding. So here's some work that we did on generating molecules with certain properties out of thin air, right? If you train this model on sort of molecules with certain different properties, and now you specify a property, and it will just generate a molecule or a number of molecules with those properties. Now, again, this is not perfect. If you show this to a chemist, you well, this doesn't look like a drug at all, right? You know, it's not quite you know, a good thing. But then the point is that every conference, and there's three big ones every year, this technology improves very rapidly to the point that you know pharmaceutical industry is getting very interested in this technology right and i've seen meteorologists going from very pessimistic like this field will not disrupt my sort of numerical simulator that runs on a supercomputer where we had a hundred years of sort of development going into this into panic mode where this is so disruptive that we really need to jump on this right now. Otherwise, you know, we lose our business model. Um, and the final one here is, a, is a by um, EPFL and uh, DeepMind. Um, it, it's a reinforcement learning problem where you try to control a plasma in a nuclear fusion reactor where the thing that you can control is magnetic fields that keep the plasma contained in the reactor without touching the um, the boundaries of the of the reactor, and again, uh, this is a machine learning tool that can do this now. Okay, so I'm I'm going to talk now about two techniques which have been developed in my lab, and uh, on which I will build in um, after this. And um, again, it's a bit pictorial, I, you know, I'm, but um, I I hope I can get sort of the idea across. And so the first one is the variational autoencoder. So if you want to learn more about this, there's a little book that uh, we wrote. Uh, introduction to Variation Autoencoders with Dirk Kingma, who was the PhD student who did the main work on this um, particular problem. So what is a Variation Autoencoder? So imagine uh, you have some data. So this is uh, maybe an echocardiogram data. It's a, maybe uh, an echocardiogram of the heart. Um, and, um, and so imagine that you have a simulator. So you have a simulator there where you throw in some random data, some random numbers, sorry, not data, random numbers, uh, from some simple distribution, like a Gaussian or something. It goes to either an actual simulator or a neural network, and then it generates an image, which is a point in this sort of very complicated manifold of data. We call this the marginal P of X. There's latent variables Z, so you generate something from a prior P of Z, and then you generate something from X given Z. That's this process as you go down. And the end result is an image, let's say, like this. That's the generator side. There's also a, um, a um, sort of analysis side, if you wish, the encoder side, which is where you start with the image, and now you want to analyze it. You want to say, what's happening in this particular image, for instance? Right? What are the factors, let's say, that, are, that determine what, you know, may, maybe the heart condition that determines this particular image? Right? Now you send, so you, you take a point on this manifold, and you send it through a neural network that analyzes it and produces this point, which is a, is a number of factors that, that determine in a compressed space, you know, what is that particular, what is in that particular, what determines that particular image of the heart, right? And you can sort of see that these two models are each, each other inverses, and they need each other. Um, so in order to learn the simulator, you need to do inference. So you need to figure out what are the factors that determine um, you know the, uh, the the image, the, the data point that I'm seeing, 
Um, and that's called the EM algorithm, or the expectation maximization algorithm. If you're a statistician, you know about that. Um, and so you need, you need an inference algorithm, and you need a um, sort of a, a, a model, which is the simulator, which is P of X. You can also think of this model here as actually a prior for the analysis model. Because here you can stick in all your, your prior data about you know, the physics of the problem, which is the simulator. And that model is sort of is, uh, biasing the analysis model to be realistic, to be conformed with the generative simulator model. And so this is, I, I think of this as sort of a yin and yang kind of relationship between the two. You can write down an objective, which is called a variation of lower bound or elbow. Uh, it's basically the distance between you know, the, the, the marginal distribution of the actual data versus the marginal distribution of the model of the data. Um, and then you can approximate that, and sort of that's what we did with Dirk King. We, we approximated that in some in some way, um, and, and, and we could learn it, it, which basically has to do a lot to do with you have to reduce the variance in the estimators. So here's the second piece of information uh, that was developed mostly by uh, Taco Cohen, uh, and later by Maurice Weiler. Now, if you're interested in this particular kind of work, there is this book that's written by Maurice Weiler um, and some others. Um, I'm basically fortunate that I wanted this book. I, I didn't do nearly as much as Maurice Wilder. He's an amazing student who this 500 pages, by the way. And it's full of these beautiful illustrations. So if you want an introduction, it, it goes like in all levels of introduction. It goes from very high level with lots of beautiful images all the way down to all the gory math. So um, definitely, if you like it, just go for it. You know, buy that. Um, and so this idea of equivariance, you know, you know, 500 pages compressed to one line is basically if, or one image even. So if I take a gecko, and it's an image of a gecko, and I want to analyze it through a neural net, let's say I get a filtered gecko, right? Or whatever you know, features I want to compute. Equivariance is saying that, well, if I translate the gecko and then filter it, it should be the same as if I fil first filter it and then translate the filtered image. And this, this T should not, doesn't have to be the same as that T um, because they act in different spaces. But for translations, it's, it's very similar. Um, you can do this on manifolds. You can generalize this a whole many different things. So why is this important? Because it hard codes the symmetry of the world in the actual model. So imagine, a, let's say, the properties of a molecule, they don't depend on where the molecule is or in which orientation I'm looking at the molecule, right? So I want my predictor to be invariant to these transformations. Now, a neural you would think, well, that's obvious, right? And so any neural network should be able to do it. The problem is the neural network doesn't understand that because if you transform, if you rotate the, let's say, the, uh, the input coordinates, it, the input coordinates are very, very different now. They're very different numbers. And it doesn't understand that's a rotated version of the input. And so you have to hard code this in. And this particular constraint, you can solve it. And you get particular uh, constraints on your, on your uh, neural network layers that you have to put in, the weight matrices. And when you put those constraints in, the model then understands the symmetry. OK, so that's, um, that's the introductory part. So that, those are the technologies. So I hope people sort of got this idea. I'm not sure if you have a quite a different background. Uh, that sort of fits with your background. Now, the next thing I want to show is um, something about how maybe the sciences can change under forces of machine learning or with new tools of the machine learning. And to, and to, to show you this, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little sort of a little uh, sort of a sort of history maybe lesson on how airplanes got designed. So, if you, the first airplanes got designed, you know, people had an idea of how to build an airplane. You build it, you fly it, if it crashes and you survive, it didn't work, you iterate, right? Um, so that's trial and error. So later, um, people said, well, okay, so we, we can actually, you know, we can build this thing, we can, we can design it and build it, put it in a wind tunnel, and then collect lots and lots of data, right? And then from, the, from that data that we collect, we can build the next iteration, right? So the final version of that is, well, we don't actually have to put this, build this thing and put it in a wind tunnel. We can just build it in a computer and then test it in a wind tunnel because we know how to simulate, you know, um, Navier-Stokes equations. Right? We know we can just you know, do this whole process in silico. 
And of course, you know, going from left to right, you need more and more compute power to do this. And something very similar happens in molecular design. So you, you can either, you know, you want to design a new drug, you know, you, you, you try a lot, you know, you see what sticks, whatever sticks is, is the drug you know, that you want. Or you can sort of build models of how things work, and you do a lot of experiments in labs, and you figure out data from that data you try to iterate. Or you, you simulate the entire dynamics of the molecule in your computer, and then try to see if you can compute the properties and optimize the properties um, of that molecule. And you know that you could call that inverse design. And I've heard people say this word a lot this morning already. So inverse design is also a theme, I think, in in, uh, in this lab. Okay, so um, perhaps in some more uh, sort of detail, what's happening is this idea of amortization. In fact, that was actually already the trick for the VAE. The VAE also said we don't have to do inference for every new instance. We can train a neural network that takes the input, puts it through a neural network, and predicts the inference directly through the neural network. So here, um, amortization means if I start with you know some model, I, I built my first car, I put it in a wind tunnel, and I get lots of data from, you know, and this could even be in silico. So this could even be a simulator in silico. So this is the next step. Now, instead of throwing away that data, I'm going to store it in a big database, and I'm going to train a neural network that tries to predict, you know, the properties of this particular design of car under, you know, the wind tunnel experiment. So next time I build my next car, I can either go know, go through the virtual wind tunnel, or I can train, I can use my neural network to, to predict these properties directly. And this is very, very much faster than this. So you can think of three or four orders of magnitude speed up uh, doing this versus doing that. And that's what I call amortization, because instead of, you know, instead of doing this again and again and again, you store it, and the compute investment is going to be amortized over this training of this neural network. You're constantly improving the neural network to do the simulations for you or to predict the properties of the car for you. Um, so in the sciences, this problem you know, is happening a lot. So, and, and the beauty about sciences is that basically it's very similar techniques that span enormous scales both in space and time. You're going from particle physics, and you know, I, I heard a beautiful talk about particle physics, so that's something that's been researched here as well, all the way to molecu molecules, I've heard people talk about molecules, to plasmas, fluid dynamics, I think people are working on fluid dynamics here, geophysics, astrophysics, right? And so going from picometers and femtoseconds all the way to giga years and, and you know, light years. And so to, to, tell, to give you an impression of how machine learning, you know, or how machine learning can help in these fields is very, very high level. Um, so on the very smallest scale, uh, this is a beautiful illustration of uh, the Schrodinger equation, uh, the, the, the time dynamic Schrodinger equation. This is unfortunately the time independent Schrodinger equation. But anyway, so these, these green clouds are basically the electron density. Um, and this is from Quanta magazine. It's a PDE, right? Um, and um, in, in, uh, what you can do in machine learning is you can actually write down something that's called density functional theory, which is a function of the density, this, this green, these green blobs, this is the density, three dimensions now. And you can try to write down the functional that you want to minimize uh, of that density in order to find the ground state. The problem is, you know, quantum mechanics is very, very difficult, but you don't know what that functional is. And so you can now learn that functional from data. So you can collect lots and lots of data for with expensive uh, quantum chemistry methods that solve the Schrodinger equation, find the ground state, um, and then don't throw away that data, stick it into a database, and now train a network that, you know, that learns that functional. And then next time, you can do it a lot faster and much more accurate. The second level up is uh, molecular dynamics. So there you take the atoms, and the atoms move, but you have to compute the forces that are uh, applied to the atoms in order to move them. It's Newtonian dynamics, although it's very chaotic and therefore very complicated. Um, but the problem is, in order to compute the forces, you actually need to solve the Schrodinger equation, because the electrons um, you know, have an, at least 50% of the forces are coming through the electrons, and those are actually following quantum mechanics. 
and so in order to compute the forces like this term, for instance, you actually need to compute quantum mechanics. But uh, machine learning has a, has again, has a, has a sort of a shortcut. It trains a neural network that predicts these forces for you. So, it's, so you can train them by expensive methods, you collect data, and then you train the force field, um, you know, and then you run this particular Langevin equation. Um, now, that already is being applied by chemists. So th th there is a, there's a whole cut uh, cottage industry, cut cotton industry for generating these force fields. And um, the people are actually already using these force fields in their simulations. So going up uh, again a notch in terms of scale, um, you can predict the weather. Um, so there the relevant equation is now the Stokes equation. It's again a PDE, so this PDE. Uh, a stochastic differential equation, again a PDE. Um, and, um, and now here, uh, there's been a success story in the sense that this is weather, global weather prediction. And uh, people have now trained what's called surrogate models that instead of actually running the numerical simulator, you train a neural network to immediately predict the future state. And um, although this feels like, well, how, how is that going to be better than the numerical simulator? So um, this actually turns out to be equally good or even better. And there's a subtle reason why this can actually be better, because these things are trained on the simulator plus the observations, um, but 10,000 times faster than the numerical simulator. So 10,000 times faster, right? So that's a really large number. And uh, meteorologists have gone from one year of being very skeptical to you know, basically, OK, we really have to start thinking about this. And now uh, meteorology offices also reconfirmed the results which were produced by computer scientists. Um, and they've shown that actually these results hold true. And, um, so that's very exciting. And then there's these beautiful applications um, in drug design. So this is a simulation where, or, or machine learning model where there's, here's the pocket of the protein. And you want to find, you want to simulate a particular drug-like molecule which would sit in that particular pocket so it can sort of neutralize maybe that disease vector. In material science, where you, where you want to, um, say, uh, predict or design a material, let's say, that takes carbon out of the air or that's a good battery material, for instance. And in catalysis, where, for instance, you want to speed up the process of generating hydrogen out of water. Um, and all of these are, in, in, are, are developing very quickly. Um, so then I want to say a few things about um, how does sort of um, machine learning, um, how, how does AI actually help the machine learning here? Um, actually, I think I may. Yeah, OK. So, so, so now we are switching to how um, machine learning, uh, how now, this is how uh, a physics is helping machine learning. I guess we made that switch now. Yeah, so how physics is helping machine learning. So, um, so this is a model where um, it's called a diffusion model, where we start with a data point. In this case, it's a very high dimensional data point. It's an image of a, of a dog. And then there is some process by which we remove that information. And uh, that's a, a diffusion process or a drift diffusion process with a drift term and a diffusion term. Um, and then the, the idea is to try to train the reverse model. So this is going in the causal direction. So this satisfies the second law of thermodynamics. So this is the proverbial egg that sort of is broken lying on the ground and that you know, assembles itself in your hand. So it's going the opposite direction of the second law, so you start from noise and you generate structured data. But if you if you have data, you can actually train this inverse model. You can write down what the inverse process is. It takes There's another score function um, that's in the middle, and you can train that thing from data. People have used these kinds of models um, quite effectively already to, for instance, simulate. Uh, but I, I should say, so the, the reason why I think that you know, the diffusion models are physics-based is because you know, they also, of course, govern the dynamics of fluids, for instance. OK, so this is some work um, with these folks here, uh, Emil Hochboom, Victor Garcias, uh, Clément Vignac. 
where uh, we are um, using these diffusion models, but now to generate molecules. Right? So we start with a sort of a, a completely noised up version of a molecule, which is all the atoms are sort of randomly dispersed and we have random uh, types. And then there's this process by which we unscramble this omelette into basically a, a thermodynamically stable molecule which could exist in the real world and which has certain properties that we might wish to have. Right, now, this model combines this diffusion-based modeling with the equivariance, right? So what does equivariance mean here in this case? It means that the probability of generating this thing or a rotated version of this thing should be identical, so mathematically identical. And, and the way to achieve that is to say, well, if I have my blob of atoms here and I rotate it and then generate, it should be the same as first generating the, in this case and then rotating it. If you force this onto your neural network, it will have this particular property. And then here you can see sort of in a, a little video of how you know how that looks like in practice. This simulator. you see they, these atoms actually change type. This is the color in this diffusion process, which is sort of diffusion over a discrete variable, as well as it you know the location of of the atom. And, and the bonds are defined by how far they are away from each other. Okay, so the second example of this um, is by these guys. It's a collaboration with uh, Bruno Carrera and Michael Blonstein. Um, so this is what I would call uh, conditional generation. So you have some kind of pocket um, that is already fixed. And now you're diffusing only the atoms inside the pocket so that they form a particular molecule which fits snugly into this particular pocket, right? And that's, of course, what you want if you want to um, you know, design a drug. Um, and then, yeah, here you can see some examples of how that works. Um, yeah, when you talk to chemists and, you know, they look at these, these molecules, they say, well, nice, but they don't look like drugs at all. Um, and then I say, yeah, that's correct for this iteration. Wait, wait a few years, and you'll find that this technology has improved a lot. So this was one of the first you know, papers that did something like that. Um, well, okay, so I need a, okay, so I don't, I don't think biologists know precisely that, say, if I have a particular pocket of a particular shape, which actual molecule, which is thermodynamically stable, would fit into that pocket. Yeah. Well, it, it ensures that it is a realistic molecule, and it ensures that it fits into the shape of the pocket at the same time. Yeah, but um, there's other techniques, right? You can also imagine you know, picking picking one atom and sticking it into one place, and then sort of searching over another other atom that's connected to that, that's sort of next to it. But it turns out that that's all quite hard because it's very sequential, and, and so so this thing sort of does it in sort of a s scale space, if you wish. It starts with a very blurry view of the world, and then becomes sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper, and it puts in all the details one by one. But yeah, I would invite people to actually ask questions. That's great. Yes. Oh, you mean the permutation of that? Or yeah, yeah, that's all in here, right? So there's, there's this particular model has permutation equivariance as well. So you, if you swap two atoms of the same type, the probability stays exactly the same. So that's all in there. Um, so here's a slightly uh, different problem then. Um, again, an application in, uh, in chemistry. And this is uh, what's called uh, transition path sampling. So if, I'm not sure if you're, there's any chemists here, but the transition path sampling is the problem of if you have, so, so this space here that I'm showing here is this, every point in that space is a molecule in a particular conformation. And um, if you have a chemical reaction, that, that particular molecule splits into two, or if you have a particular you know, transformation 
of the actual shape of this thing. Let's say a folding, for instance. If you're in one state and you fold to another state, that could be a path in this space. And this space is just the energy space. There's valleys, there's, there's minima in this space where the stable or metastable molecules are sitting. Of course, they're vibrating there, but they don't typically come easily out of that minima. And um, if you have a reaction, you need to get over one of these or over one of these hubs into the next minimum. That's an actual reaction. And if you try to simulate that by just doing molecular dynamics, you will wait forever, right? Because the transition time going from here to here is like the age of the universe or something like that. It's like ridiculously long. Um, and so um, what you then do is you have to sort of, like, like uh, poor Sisyphus here, you have to sort of design a force sort of the, where you gently push the particular molecule in the right direction. And then later you compensate when you compute free energy differences and, and reaction rates. You then compensate for the fact that you did that. That's basically the core idea. But you can think of this as a control problem now, right? Because you know, what forces should Sisyphus apply to each one of the particular atoms in order to push it gently you know, from one to the other conformation in such a way that it actually goes over this lowest free energy barrier here and doesn't go in some other weird route, right? Because we want this route to be at least the one that it would, it would take if we wait long enough. So, so that's the problem we want to solve. And you can, you know, you can think of that as a, basically as a controlled Langevin dynamics problem, right? So in Langevin dynamics, you have a position and a velocity. The position changes under the velocity. The velocity changes under the gradient of the um, potential, and then plus um, noise, plus a control force. Right? And the control force we can learn. And therefore, uh, we can reward this problem by uh, basically every time it does get to the right, does get to the right sort of next bucket, we can reward it positively. If it doesn't reach it, we can reward it negatively. And we can then sort of compute the right control for the minimal control forces to get from A to B. And if we make the reward function the right reward function, it will actually take that minimal path, the right path. So we did that and um, you know, formulated this control problem. And then here, sort of, you see in a two-dimensional plane, of course, made, this is like free energy space because we've integrated out many degrees of freedom. Here, you see the actual molecule as it is moving under the controlled force. And here you see it being pushed on the free energy surface from this local minima to this local minima here, I think. Yeah. And then, you know, here you see the energy. Um, and then we have many more of these examples. Uh, we've improved this method actually already quite a bit. It's at NeurIPS now uh, this year, if you want to check it out. There's a paper out. Um, so the bigger the molecule gets, the harder the problem gets. It gets more random. But you know, even for these bigger molecules, you can see it actually you can actually get it from one confirmation into the next confirmation. And then uh, finally, an even bigger one, uh, which is a uh, chicken. In. And that's you can think of this basically as a protein folding problem. OK, so uh, yeah, of course. So this is actually trained using reinforcement learning. So you don't have to have supervised data. You just need a reward function. Right? But you do need realistic dynamics. And the Langevin dynamics is the realistic dynamics. right? So the uncontrolled dynamic. So the uncontrolled dynamics, if this is 0, that's just Langevin dynamics, with, and where u basically is the u that has all the all physical forces in it. Yes, it does, right? It, 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 you can now, for instance, compute the reaction rate. How often you know, will this molecule make this transition versus this transition versus this transition? So it does tell you a lot about that. You can actually explore the entire potential function surface, potential energy surface is what's called, by you know, doing this training. OK, so um, I, I want to finish with uh, this. I guess I started a little late. But um, with this particular 
Does that then work? Which is now really the reverse, which how can we now use um, um, machine learning? Uh, no, how can we use physics to improve machine learning? It's a little bit gobbled up in my head. But okay, so how, in this case, we're going to try to find physics, physics principles to improve our models in AI. Okay, so again, this diagram here is this diagram of equivariance. It's saying, but now I'm doing it over time. I'm showing this as a diagram over time. So I have some input data. And I have some symmetry transformation in the world. I rotate my molecule, let's say, right? And then there is my rotated molecule. Equivariance is saying if I, I now encode this particular input you know, point, like a, a, an image or, or a molecule or whatever, into some hidden space. And now I'm gonna, and I'm gonna actually have some dynamics in this hidden space. And then I have a transformed set of activations, think of these brain you know, activations or whatever in your neural network. And then you take this, and then from there you decode back to the, to the X space. So when uh, this morning I heard about Koopman operators, or Koopman operators, I think this guy must be Dutch, because Koopman operators right where it's So um, that's very similar to this, except for now the map is not linear, but the map is now nonlinear. Right? It's like an, it's a, just an or, any deep neural network that you wish to train. But it leaves the question of what to do here. Right? What kind of inductive bias are we going to put on that transformation of the hidden states? And that's the interesting question that I want to ans ask myself. Um, the reason why we got interested was, you know, because this is related to symmetries, but we started talking to neuroscientists, and in particular we are now working with uh, Terence Sanowski and Lyle Muller, and they are trying to figure out, they, they're seeing that in the brain there's waves, so there's waves of activity. If you activate it, you then see waves over your cortex, and they're trying to understand what that is. And they were pretty excited when they saw we can very easily generate these waves, right? So we can think of, you know, take an image, you know, map it to, to some brain state or whatever, some hidden state in your neural network, then do some PDE, maybe some wave equation in your latent space, and then decode back to the transformed space. And the nice thing about this is it looks like equivariance, but it's actually generalized, in, in, in a generalized version of equivariance. Um, because this also, you know, if we figure out something here that's reasonable, we don't need representation theory for that group. We don't, we don't even need to know this is a group. We don't even, you know, don't, we don't need to know the transformation because we just look at the data. So it's a much more general concept of how we want to model the world. You can more see it's just like a homomorphism of the real world. So we have in our brain there should be some kind of homomorphic representation of the of the state of the world that evolves in a similar way to the world, but you know, in its own space. If you want to map this to equations, uh, basically it is a kind of variational autoencoder. You have an encoding state that goes like here. Then there is dynamics in the latent space. There's dynamics in the in the world space. And then there's, it's, it, again, there's sort of generation on this side, which is like the decoder of the variational autoencoder. And you can write that this equation should sort of hold, this commutation diagram should, should close. And you can write that in a particular equation. Okay, so um, the model that we chose, so now we're going to make it slightly more explicit. So we're going to put some, some, some image sequence, and we're going to rotate the image sequence on the input side. We're going to have some encoder, some neural net. And then we, we choose as dynamics here a, basically a bunch of oscillators. So now every neuron is an oscillator that goes up and down. The neuron is connected to its neighbors. So if this goes up, you know, the neighbors will get excited as well. And you can sort of see that would create waves, right? Um, and then this is, in particular, the dynamics that we use. There's some damping terms. There's some driving terms from the data. There's convolutions over both x and velocities. And then you update the state with the actual velocity. And then what you see is actually that if you, if you start to learn, and this is an actual thing you know, from the simulation, if you start to learn sort of parameters here, the Ws and the V and the B and the and stuff, all that you learn, that what you get out is that the dynamics in the latent space actually generate waves. Right? So in order to represent dynamics in this brain, 
it will generate waves. And the waves generate, basically represent the rotation of this thing. And actually, by the way, this is on a torus, so it is periodic bound recognition. Okay, so, you know, in terms of equivariance, and this, the paper is uh, um, published now, it's called Neural Wave Machine. Um, so you start with an image, you encode it in some latent space, then there is, you know, a, a vector field that we're training. We move the particular representation according to the vector field. Um, then we get to the output and we generate the image back. Right. And that's a form of equivariance because if you first take X and then you transform it and then map it, it's the same as first mapping it and then transforming it, but then in the latent space. And the nice thing is that, um, I'm not sure how much, I'm running out of time a little bit, I think now, right? Um, so the nice thing is that if you know about um, sort of, you know, tuning in the brain. So th this is a map, or actually this is the real map, of orientation tuning in the brain, in the cortex. And that tells you for neurons in which direction they're most sensitive, which direction they're most sensitive. Right? And if you look at the map that you get, you know, in, in this sort of artificial model, is you'll get very, very similar sort of maps. Um, and in fact, you get these, these topological defects, which are called pinwheels as well, which is very nice. Um, and basically what happens is that, you know, we have latent spaces, right? These, these are like this. So they develop these waves. And then somehow if you do this often enough, what you get out is this kind of um, orientation maps in the brain. Now, why that precisely happens, I don't know. But, you know, at least in experiments, it does. Okay, so the last part I want to talk about how you can use this for uh, a, n a new way to build disentangled representations. And this morning I also had an interesting discussion, my first discussion, in fact, over you know, how you can build sort of new representations. So the old way to have a representation is to take an image. So, so let's say this is my input space now. And now I have a path in my input space. So I take an image, I first change the color, which is one transformation. Then I rotate the image. And then I scale the image, right? So I have some path where I do different things to the particular image. And every time I have an, have an encoder that maps that state into a state into a state in my latest in my latest space, right? So here they all go to the to their latest space. But in addition to that, I'm going to define a tangent space in this space. And if you're a mathematician, you might know that this is called, I think autocalculus or something like this. So there is a particular mathematical framework that um, is a fiber bundle over distributions. It's related to optimal transport. And it's basically you're using the Fokker-Planck equation to transport equations from one part to the other part along a vector field. And here's just the continuity equation. T is the gradient of some vector field. And then this is just the continuity equation for transporting this distribution from A to B. And we can learn that, right? So we, we can basically say, we can give it first many examples of transformations. We can give a whole bunch of these transformations and a whole bunch of these transformations. And then say, and then uh, say, well, learn you know, how to get from here to here. And it will learn all of these, these symmetries. But you can even go one step further. It says, don't, don't give it anything. Just, just give it data. And just find you know, this, these vectors, this, a basis for these vectors um, at every point. And if you, if you then need to figure out how to go from A to B, you're not only and you're not only inferring the state, but you're also inferring you know, the direction, the linear combination of these particular vectors, velocity vectors that you need to follow in order to get from A to B. Right? And I find this a much more appealing idea as a representation or a disentangled representation than just looking at Z because it's this, these velocities which also tell you how to change, not just what you are, but also how to change, right? And it's like disentanglement sort of means like subspaces which transform into each other in some sense. Or, yeah. Okay, anyway, th this is still something that's under, under development. Um, here's some examples, so you can, you can just ask it. Let's say first, so this model is now trained, and now you're, ask, you're pushing new data in it. They first rotate and then color, right? And it does all this quite effortlessly. Or in this data set, first change the wall hue, then change the optic hue. Or first change the floor hue, then change the wall hue, right? And it just figures all these things out. 
Um, and you, you can also do linear combinations of things. You can ask, both scale the object and change the object hue at the same time, which is just different a different velocity field in the space. And you know it can do both of these things at the same time, or wall hue plus four hue, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the extensions of that we're looking at is um, we're looking at fully unsupervised training. So right now, we're just giving it some some clean transformations. And we don't tell it what the transformation is, but we, at least the transformation is clean. It's either a rotation or it's a scale. The next thing is we just give it any sets of transformations. Now figure out you know, a, a, a set of directions, a set of you know, transformations that you like most, and that every other new sequence should be a linear combination of. And the last thing is a bit, you know, is one of these things that you do when you're old enough or when you have students that are already graduated and they have some extra time, which is uh, you say, well, let's go crazy and say, that's now, some people claim that the brain has some quantum mechanics running in it. I don't believe it, but some people claim this. What I could believe is that there is a mathematics of quantum mechanics that could be a good description of something that happens in the brain. But, you know, an actual brain running quantum mechanics is very unlikely due to decoherence effects, etc. But one question you can ask yourself is, can we just try that, right? Just instead of the fokker planck equation, just put the Schrodinger equation in there, see what happens, right? It's very difficult because, you know, Schrodinger equation takes exponential time to solve. If we have a quantum computer, we can use, we can actually solve it. But we, what we are currently doing is we are approximating the, you know, the um, Schrodinger equation with something that has limited entanglement and therefore can be simulated, but we want to see whether it's going to use this entanglement and then in some limit um, it will it will actually uh, be a quantum computer. Okay, so I'm going to end up, I'm going to stop now soon. So the, the, the one thing I want to say is that um, I'm very excited about the huge opportunity in AI for science. A number of things are coming together, including you know, these, these, these biology and chemistry and physics sciences, which are very mature, the computational sciences with simulators and machine learning, and in the future, hopefully, quantum computing, which can really help out with better modeling. And then the applications which are pulling this, this important field in health and in energy transition and in sustainability. Um, and I, I just, at some point, hope that uh, we will be able to build a search engine for materials, where we say, I want a material with these properties and a whole computation sets off in, in, in a computer and a list of 100 materials which might have those properties will be generated automatically. Um, so I see a very rich uh, synergy between AI and natural sciences. Um, and uh, I talked about molecule generation and diffusion models in the brain. Um, and I, as I said, I'm very excited about these applications because I think they can have huge societal impact. Thank you.